Hey guys, it's John McBride. We're just doing a, uh, another awesome webinar, uh, telling you guys a little bit about uh, what's going on in the industries and things that uh, RMUS is involved in, uh, helping out people make decisions, uh, scaling, education, training. And these webinars definitely help us uh, push out uh, information to the industry, uh, understanding our experience and time, but we'll give it a couple more minutes here to uh, Basically, just, uh, just another minute to make sure people are joined. Uh, if you guys uh, have any questions, make sure you do that in the chat window uh, of the uh, webinar itself on, on Vimeo here. So if you do, again, have questions, make sure that you're using the chat window. This way, Jace can see those questions and he'll moderate those as we go through our presentation uh, with Boston Dynamics. And that's who we're going to be talking about and who we're talking with today uh, and showing a bit more about capability on the um, spot. So Boston Dynamics spot. So we'll just give this a, another 20 seconds or so, make sure everybody's good to go. You can go ahead and put in the chat window that the audio sounds good, uh, no issues with the broadcast or anything li like that. So, and I think in my earphones, Jace, I'm just hearing a, uh, uh, it sounds like a- the, We're not pushing our audio live. You're just, you can still hear everybody else. Okay, perfect. It's not live yet. Excellent. Yeah, always have to have my magic maker, Jace, doing his thing, and he's so good at it, so <laughs> it's perfect. Uh, so at any rate, we want to make sure everybody's joining okay. Chat window again. Make sure that you're uh, uh, addressing any questions during the presentation, and we'll try to get to all of those questions by the end of the presentation. Uh, we have this scheduled webinar for about an hour. Uh, if we end up going a little bit longer than that, uh, I, I, not a big deal. We'll uh, try to keep people on the line and make sure we are asking great questions uh, and uh, we have our current presenters here. So uh, again, I wanted to uh, talk a, um, a bit more about uh, what we're doing as far as our relationship with uh, Boston Dynamics and as well as uh, uh, the new, uh, I wouldn't call it the new spot, but uh, we've definitely seen this out in the market. We've seen this on YouTube. We've seen Adam's Savage messing around with it. We've seen it uh, grabbing doors and picking things up and you know all kinds of fancy integrations that uh, basically taking a, a walking uh, and what is the correct term here Jace a pet pet petropod or what what is it Jace quadruped <laughs> we're taking a quadruped and uh, instead of a drone instead of something with wheels instead of a, a different type of tracked robot and these guys have just been doing some really great and awesome stuff with it. So we're super excited to try and show everybody uh, basically what, what that means and what it is. So uh, I did want to go ahead and introduce uh, Kevin Totterall. If you are not familiar with Kevin, uh, Kevin is actually our, our Arm US Canada arm. He uh, runs the whole show up there in Canada. So uh, I, I know we've had a lot of inquiry about this. We've had a lot of people talking about it. They, I, and I think we've had a lot more people up in your uh, neighborhood that has been like, look, tell us what this is about. We, we're just seeing all this neat stuff. So Kevin, if you could just give us a little bit of uh, information uh, you know, on this type of stuff. Yeah, thanks, John. Thank you very much. We, uh, we uh, are excited to be here. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us. I know there's a lot of Canadians on. Uh, John's certainly right. We had a lot of um, we had a lot of early interest in in, in spot up here in Canada. Um, obviously, we do a lot of work in the not only the public safety space but in the energy space as well as some mining. Uh, and there's some fantastic applications from people that are already using some of our other uh, uh, not only UAVs but some of our confined space UAVs like the the flyability Helios, etc. And so. This is something that is uh, an excellent complement to a lot of those really dangerous confined space or contaminated space um, inspections or monitoring. So we're very excited and, and uh, many of the big uh, agencies and uh, uh, utilities have been very interested in or in the process of testing some of this uh, equipment already. And so we're very excited to, uh, to be having SPOT as part of our POC proof of concept program for uh, companies that are interested in proving out business cases. Uh, and so we will be um, actively uh, starting those in September. Uh, again, focus initially will be um, mining, public safety and utilities. But uh, if there's interest in other areas, certainly we'll be willing to entertain that. But again, 
a lot of opportunities to integrate sensors to work in the communication system. So it's an extremely innovative product uh, for uh, existing applications, but also for innovation teams that are looking to build uh, to build on this as well. So I think it's going to be really, really exciting, and we're hoping to leverage uh, some of our university partnerships with University of Waterloo, UOIT, uh, U of T institutions like that as they, they themselves start to take interest in possibly building on these platforms. So really excited uh, about the partnership and to, uh, to show you all a little bit more detail today. Uh, so you can always contact us up here if you have any questions as well. Thanks, John. Excellent. Uh, I, you know, our relationship on what we've been doing in Canada so far and us having you be there, Kevin, has just been absolutely uh, necessary and important on what on getting this and providing this type of equipment. I would almost say that uh, you were kind of the bigger proponent in looking into this relationship. So I really, you know, we really do value uh, any input moving forward. Of course, you had mentioned doing some more uh, proof of concept ideas and, and showing capabilities in September. Uh, we are uh, scheduled to get a unit here fairly soon, so uh, of course I have to send it back up to you and let you play with it, but that's okay. <laughs> so uh, really excited about that as well. So um, thanks, Kevin. And uh, uh, as we uh, finish up the broadcast a little bit later, we'll go ahead and uh, uh, try to uh, uh, make sure you guys know again who Kevin is and what, what role he plays in, in actually getting this uh, equipment out there and scheduling maybe some of these uh, proof of concept ideas as well as uh, scaling and, and growing your guys' uh, uh, overall uh, drone and equipment program. So, um, but let's just get right to it. Uh, again, we've seen this out in the market. We've seen it um, actually not, I would say I don't see it doing a lot of absolutely awesome work because it still seems very new. I think it's fairly new. but. Fortunately, we have Matt Knights here. He's the uh, director of sales for Boston Dynamics, and Matt is going to basically give us a, an overall what they've been doing with it, a, a, a good presentation, if you will, to uh, understand exactly how Spot works and uh, 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 everything else. So I wanted to go ahead and welcome Matt Knights uh, from Boston Dynamics onto the show. Uh, Thank you again for joining us, Matt, and, and clearly giving us a, a, I, mean, I can't, obviously Kevin and I are pretty excited about this thing. We definitely want to have one. And, you know, maybe just a little bit about what you do and as well, you can just go right into what this is about. What is SPOT about? Sure, yeah. Thank you very much for having me today. Uh, certainly looking forward to the partnership and seeing more deployments. Um, I'll go ahead and I'll share my screen and give folks just a general idea on what we're seeing uh, out in the marketplace today. Um, so I'm assuming everyone can see the screen here. Uh, but the, the general agenda of what I was hoping to get across was a quick introduction of who we are at Boston Dynamics, um, where Spot fits into current state, uh, an overview on the actual technology itself, uh, some industries and use cases that we're seeing start to take off, an overview on uh, different payloads and sensor integrations, and then hopefully we're going to have a live demo. In our to get it, the live demo, we'll show some uh, demo videos. But I think just as a quick introduction to who Boston Dynamics is, uh, you know, most people This you, you'll see is Atlas, our humanoid robot. Uh, and this is, you know, something that you're doing a lot of testing on. We're trying to tackle some of the most difficult robotics challenges in the world uh, with Atlas. Uh, so not just put out cool YouTube videos, but take all the learnings that we're getting uh, from the testing and things that we're doing and bring them into future products. Um, so that's how people a lot of times do know us. Uh, what people are often surprised to find out is that the company has been around for about 25 years. Always been focused on legged robots. Um, this here is Big Dog, one of our first robots to leave the lab. Uh, and then this is LS3, which was an 800 pound robot designed to carry. Uh, and we always focus on going into these sort of antagonistic in unknown 
uh, unstructured terrains. Then we started to think, you know, what if we could reduce the form factor of the robot to someday operate in human purpose environments uh, and maybe doing human purpose tasks? So we moved from hydraulic actuation to electric actuation. We moved from diesel power to electric power. Uh, and we introduced Spot Mini, again, in, in a research function. But the idea was, um, you know, can it operate safely, safely around people in environments that were designed for people, um, but still maintain that durability uh, and that, you know, strength and robustness that we had always been known for. Um, so the days of a robot doing your laundry or doing your dishes may be a little bit far off. Um, but we think we're getting really close uh, to seeing really positive impacts, global impacts of the technology. So then a couple years ago, we started to think about commercializing for the first time, because for the first bunch of years, we were purely a research shop. And we were thinking about where are the areas where we can make an impact. Um, and we came up with three. Number one was improve safety. So sending a robot into an environment where you don't want people to be, whether that's a nuclear containment area or an underground mine or for incident response purposes, uh, we thought we could make a really big impact um, by just teleoperate controlling the robot uh, in an unsafe environment. The other is logistically challenging environments. So we thought we could improve operations by having a robot operate in a remote substation or an offshore oil rig instead of having a crew fly out on a helicopter, you know, one day, what if you had a robot living there um, to be able to sense and inspect the environment? Uh, and then the third piece that we think we can make a, a big impact is bringing a level of automation into environments that weren't designed for automation. So when you think about uh, new manufacturing facilities, they're designed with robots in mind. But a lot of the facilities we're operating in today were built you know, 50, 60 years ago, if not longer. So they have stairs, um, they have pipes, they have obstacles that are challenging for traditional automation solutions. Setting up a, you know, a fixed sensor at every single location that you want to get a reading is extremely expensive. So having a mobile robot that can take sensors to an environment could be really valuable. Um, so those are the areas we thought that we could uh, play. So we, we built um, what is now Spot, uh, and there were a few key things and considerations that went into the design. One, we wanted the robot to be terrain agnostic. So ability to go up and down stairs, you know, graded walkways, curbs, grass, snow, water, uh, very difficult environments, environments where, you know, people can go into. Uh, two, we wanted to make the robot versatile. So we wanted to make sure that it could be configured with different sensors. It can hold up to 14 kilograms of different payloads. And you, if you see here, there's a couple different payloads on this robot, uh, but you can add and mix and match payloads. We wanted to have a flexible API so you could integrate different software packages. Uh, so there's an open Python-based API. Um, and we wanted to be able to operate for a decent amount of time. So the battery today will give you 90 minutes of runtime. In addition to that, we wanted to make sure that the robot wasn't just a cool lab toy, that it was really designed. Um, so it's Um, it has obstacles. It's IP54 rated. Um, so, you know, rain. So that's sort of the mindset um, going in. From here, I can give you a little bit of an idea on the different industries uh, and the applications that we're seeing. Um, so I think some of the key industries that Kevin mentioned earlier um, will fall in this category. But number one, you know, electric utilities. So going into an environment like a nuclear generation plant or a converter station or a thyristor hall um, to do inspections that are unsafe 
you know, doing visual inspections, thermal camera inspections, gas detection. Uh, even we have customers looking at analog gauge reading. Um, so having the robot go around and read analog gauges and then upload that data. Um, so this, this helps with the safety factor and also uh, with the logistics factor. So think about a substation five hours away from anybody. Um, you know, having the ability to have a robot live there could be really attractive. Another industry uh, that's really interesting for us is the mining industry. So uh, often from a safety standpoint, you know, pre and post blast inspections, doing 3D laser scans, visual inspections, fall of ground scenarios, um, sending a robot in rather than a person. And then on the maintenance side, uh, you know, conveyor line inspection. So today, having instead of having people with a thermal camera or vibration tool walking a conveyor line, um, the idea of having a robot walking that line is, is really interesting to some of our customers. Uh, in, addition, in addition to those industries, you know, we've seen a lot of interest in the construction environment, um, doing digital twin capture, uh, taking 3D laser scans and uploading that data to a BIM software, uh, to ensure as built meet, meet the design. Um, today, that's a very manual process, having a person take a, a scanner, put it in a place, do the scan, go to the next spot, uh, stop, do the scan. It takes a lot of time. And the other thing that you find is people aren't necessarily great at doing repeated processes, going to the exact same location and doing the exact same thing, whereas robots follow instructions really well. Um, so the ability to go to the same environment, take the scan, move to the next waypoint, take the scan, uh, has been really valuable for a lot of our customers. Uh, another industry that, that has seemed to get a significant amount of interest uh, is in the oil and gas space. Uh, uh, can you guys hear me all right? I can hear you. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. I thought, I thought I heard someone say uh, they lost my audio. Okay, cool. Um, sorry about that. So no in the oil and gas space, uh, we're seeing a lot of interest, um, you know, offshore oil rigs instead of flying a helicopter with a crew, both from a safety and a cost savings standpoint. Uh, autonomous rounds and readings. So today, these operator rounds where people are going around looking at motors, bearings, oil levels, electrical equipment, uh, listening to the environment. Um, the idea of having a robot do those things in an autonomous fashion is really interesting uh, to a lot of our oil and gas customers. In addition uh, to, you know, refineries and those types of environments, we've seen folks in the fracking space uh, that want to do, you know, leak inspection when they're uh, pressurizing pipes. Uh, so having people there is really dangerous, but having a robot... Um, you know, in that environment gives them a better view of the environment. In addition to the industrial environments, um, you know, we are seeing a lot of interest in the public safety environment uh, or industry. So situational awareness, uh, CBRNE detection, crime scene mapping. So going into an environment that's unsafe uh, for uh, you know, a detective and getting initial 3D scans, visual inspection of the environment. And then another industry that we candidly never really thought of as we were designing Spot, but, but shows the promise of building an open platform is the healthcare industry. So the idea of using a robot for telemedicine, uh, you know, with intake of COVID patients, disinfecting environments, uh, doing delivery of foods just to reduce the amount of interaction between healthcare workers and patients uh, became really interesting um, for some of our customers recently, obviously. In addition to the, these industries, we're seeing a lot of research uh, at universities and research organizations. Uh, and then we're even seeing a decent amount of interest in the entertainment space, uh, which has been exciting for us. Uh, you know, recently we had 20 robots uh, dancing at a Japanese baseball game, uh, you know, and it was pretty cool to see to some music. Uh, so the entertainment space is, is actually really interesting for us uh, and a lot of our customers. 
So let me give a little bit of an overview on, you know, I talked about the industries, the applications, the use cases, but let me give you a little bit of an overview on the payloads that, that you can mount on spot. Uh, and to give you an idea of sort of how these inspections are done. Um, so, you know, you hear me talking a lot about visual inspections. So um, let me preface this with, you know, we have designed a couple different payloads on our own that are integrated and have mounts for the robot. Uh, but being an open platform, th these aren't the only types of payloads that you can use. So if you have your own visual camera, uh, your own pan tilt zoom camera. You can mount that on the robot. You can do the integration on the robot. Um, but we've seen a lot of folks that are using spot cam, which is basically a 360 camera, better situational awareness. And then we have a spot cam plus with a PTZ that gives you 30x optical zoom, uh, pan tilt zoom capability, uh, and pretty high resolution images. In addition to those, we've also built an enhanced autonomy payload. Uh, so the idea with that is the robot itself uses visual odometry to identify where it is and go on these autonomous missions that you've sent it on before. And I can show a little bit of a video on that later. Uh, but in an environment that doesn't have a lot of identifiable form factors uh, very close, you can use a LIDAR to extend that range out, or an environment that's changing regularly, you can use a LIDAR to extend that range out. In addition to those, uh, we're seeing a lot of folks uh, integrate different uh, you know, software platforms, different intelligence, we'll talk about that a little bit. To do that, we enable sort of an external compute solution. So this is an example of what we call spot core, and then we have a spot core uh, plus AI, that's just even a beefier compute. Uh, and the idea is you can take and integrate um, different software platforms. So to give you an idea on some of the things that are being done in the on third party spaces, we're seeing folks that are using gesture commands. So, you know, move your hands this way or that way to send the robot and drive the robot. Uh, fleet management of multiple robots, not just uh, you know, spot, but other robots and being able to manage those fleets. We've seen folks integrate 4G and 5G uh, LTE for teleoperation control. Uh, and then we've seen a lot of different computer vision models for leak detection, corrosion, uh, the analog gauge scenario that I mentioned earlier uses a computer vision model. Um, so the idea of this open platform, we've seen a lot of interesting developments on it. So a couple examples uh, on some of the third-party payloads that, that we've seen, uh, you know, mesh radio systems. So uh, the robot itself has point-to-point -point, uh, point -point Wi-Fi to communicate from the controller to the robot. But if you want to extend that range, you can operate either over a, a Wi-Fi network if you're on the same SSID or in a place where Wi-Fi doesn't work or LTE doesn't work. Um, you can use these mesh radio systems to extend the range out. So thinking underground mining type environment. Um, and we've partnered with a few different folks in that, in that space. Uh, and you can see an example on the back of the robot here. In addition to that, uh, another third party example. So FLIR systems, uh, thermal imaging manufacturer, uh, sensing manufacturer. Uh, they've done some integration of thermal cameras for the robot along with a uh, multi-gas sensor. Um, so, you know, gas sensor that traditionally could go on a drone uh, can also mount on spot to look at sort of elevated level of gas in an environment. And then on the 3D scanning side, there have been some partners in that space uh, that have done some integrations and a good example, uh, in addition to the Velodyne that you see earlier uh, is Trimble. So Trimble's done some integrations with their 3D laser scanner, along with an RTK GPS solution. So you have the ability to, uh, you know, drive the robot in an environment uh, down to, you know, centimeters of accuracy when it comes to GPS. One of the most exciting uh, payloads that we're working on is actually the arm. So this is a video 
um, that I'll show you of uh, the arm opening a door. So one thing that's really interesting here uh, is this gives us the ability not only to sense an environment, but to now manipulate the environment. So to open a door, uh, to turn a, you know, a valve, to pull a breaker, all those types of things, it takes us sort of to the next level from autonomous inspection to actually teleoperation manipulation. You found a problem, now you can do something about that. One important note on that video that I just showed, we're gonna have some closed loop controls, uh, and that is one. So the idea is you tell the robot, open a door, uh, and then the robot will figure out a strategy to open the door. And to sort of prove that, uh, you know, we opened every door in our office with the robot. So push doors, pull doors, different types of handles. The robot is figuring out how to get these doors open. It has force control, so it understands, you know, how hard it needs to pull or push or twist. Um, so in addition to opening doors, we also think, you know, picking things up, turning valves um, could be other areas where we're, we'll work on uh, closed loop solutions. And then you'll also have the ability to, you know, control and teleoperate and control the arm. Um, so from here, uh, maybe I'll take a pause and, and I can pass it back uh, over. And if we can mm -hmm. talk about some of the other third party integrations that the RMUS team has uh, been working on. I, I'm blown away. <laughs> like it's, it's absolutely this. This thing is just you know when you when you watch a video like this, and 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 the presentation like this, Matt, you're you're just constantly like just my brain is is constantly turning on applications and capability and 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 showing what you've already had experience with and and doing is just it's just blowing me away. Um, and and it's 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 kind of a shocking to me with as much as I've worked with public safety. Uh, over the years that we don't see a lot of the quadruped type things being used as often in in public safety. Always these tracked wheels, you know, a wire connected, you know, all these other things. But yeah, just just to, to go into basically what we do at RMUS is definitely integration. You know, we try to figure out what exactly the solution is going to be for whatever customer that we have. We've, we've done you know, a number of different things with that, taking again FLIR cameras, figuring out how to put them on a drone, uh, putting it on a snake. Uh, as you had mentioned, you, know, you guys already have a, a working with a, you know, gas solutions and again, I'm using multi-ray uh, systems to do any gas snippers and, and re more recently is our, is our uh, the hover map in which we're doing Again, a, another LiDAR integration onto, onto whatever solution we're talking about. So it's really fantastic to see uh, how many people have uh, actually tried to do their own setups. This may require a bit of more software development, as you had mentioned, working with uh, you know, your guys' pieces of hardware. But I did want to um, kind of see, again, your take, maybe why. I, I'm just talking about this public safety side, Matt. I'm not just... I don't know why so many have that uh, you know idea that the that the track solution versus this solution it just seems so much easier. I, I don't know. Just wanted to maybe get your perspective on that. Sure. Yeah. Th yeah. I think the reality is um, there has not been a quadruped or a legged robot uh, available. This is why folks have been using uh, you know tracked or wheeled robot. And that's why we're seeing a lot of interest, uh, you know, on with Spot in that space is, you know, the ability to go up and down stairs by itself uh, as a human isn't that impressive, but as a robot, it's really impressive. And we have a live demo set up um, in a little bit where Hannah, uh, our robot operator, will drive the robot up a rock ramp and down a set of stairs. Uh, and one important thing to note there is when you're operating the robot, um, you're just hitting a joystick, moving it forward. And the robot's making its own decisions on, on what to step on, what to step over. So not only the ability to go into more difficult terrain, uh, but the feedback that we've heard from public safety is operationally, um, the robot's a lot easier to drive. Mm -hmm. You can just say, you know, point to go, go to this location, and the robot figures out the strategy. 
versus a lot of traditional platforms are very individually, uh, individual part moved, meaning, you know, move forward 10 feet, uh, you know, move the arm up, move the arm forward, grab this with this many newtons of force, twist it. Um, so, so it's an industry that we're really interested in uh, and it's really exciting for us. And I think the reason that you haven't seen more is just because, you know, Spot's really the first industrial grade uh, four-legged robot to hit the market. So, totally, totally makes sense there. I mean, I, I I can see that. I've just you know again I've been involved with a lot of that you know public safety and just kind of seeing that. But you, uh, yeah, let's go let's go ahead and uh, uh, introduce uh, Hannah Rossi. Hannah is a robotics engineer for uh, Boston Dynamics. Um, to be quite honest, after meeting Hannah and talking to her, she probably has by far one of the coolest jobs I think besides my my own job. Everybody thinks I have a really cool job of messing around with stuff, but man, she, she as far as uh, operating, running, uh, testing, uh, integrating, I mean, all this stuff is just really cool. So I just wanted to go ahead and introduce Hannah. Maybe a quick, uh, again, what you do, Hannah, um, as far as uh, the, uh, uh, what you do with BD, and it looks like you're literally sitting inside of a, a testing space. You know, that's what you do. Yeah, uh, so I mainly uh, test the robots that um, the software engineers and all the uh, people who build the robot um, put together. So I test out new software, uh, new behaviors, make sure it works, make sure it's reliable for customers. Uh, that's my day to day. And then the other part of my day usually ends up being um, going and demoing the robot just like I'm doing today. Uh, showing people how to use it, asking, you know, demonstrating its basic capabilities, and uh, just showing it off because it's such a cool piece of equipment. So, really excited to be here. Absolutely. So, as far as a cool piece of equipment, like I said, you like. So, from what I understand, you you can possibly actually, if if I had the capability of having a laptop here, this is also something that I can possibly drive or even control via your laboratory, even from my space here in Utah. Is that, is that correct? I mean, we're capable of even doing such a thing? Yeah, that's, uh, that's correct. Uh, so we have a, uh, I wouldn't call it a, maybe it would be a plugin, but uh, essentially we have a few different ways of driving the robot. One is with the tablet, which is if you've seen any of our videos, uh, somebody's holding a tablet with a touch screen and a joystick. And then the other way is um, through web teleops. So we have a address that only lives for as long as we want it to. Uh, we send that out to people uh, when they want to test drive it. Uh, and then they can drive it from the comfort of their home, which is really exciting. Uh, and we get to see that today. Um, so it's bringing the robot not only to people physically, but also if like remotely is one of the focuses uh, that we want to bring into the world along with ushering spot in. Mm, excellent. Well, well, we'll let you take it from there, uh, Hannah. Go ahead and, uh, you know, share screen, whatever you're going to be doing there. And we'd love to see it just kind of travel around and maybe an explanation of what you're actually seeing on the screen and, and, uh, and everything else. So awesome. Great. So uh, what you're seeing now is um, Matt is actually sharing the screen, but I'm going to be driving the robot. Um, so the robot is sitting in the laboratory right now. I'm gonna wake it up. There we go. I'm gonna drive it forward. And what I'm doing is I'm using the WASD key so you can see it um, on the screen below. And just to highlight what you're looking at, the black and white views are the stereo camera views. Those are on the robot. Uh, there's five of them, two in the front, one on each side, one in the back. Um, and then we also have um, the robot terrain view, and that one's pretty exciting because that's a 3D model of what the robot is perceiving at all times. So you can see that it you can see that there's a, uh, a step to step over, and then um, you can see that update in real time uh, with the robot terrain view. Uh, the robot terrain view will actually be a little more accurate and a little less laggy uh, because mm -hmm. the data is going straight uh, into the server. So uh, the other two views, uh, LabVIEW 1 and LabVIEW 2, those are third-party cameras that we use to help customers uh, see 
exactly what it is uh, they're driving around. You can easily drive the robot with its robot camera, uh, as well as um, the robot terrain view. Um, and the robot terrain view, I should point out, is something that's special to Teleop. So uh, with this Teleop interface, uh, if you see over to the left, you can see battery life and battery health. These are all things that can be designed into um, whatever the customer wants. So this is what we chose to pull from our SDK uh, package. So all of this, all these capabilities you're seeing at the moment are available to people uh, and it's not anything proprietary. So they could easily design their own teleop system if they wanted to. This is just one that we designed. And it is different than the tablet that we usually use. Um, this is a little simplified, for example, um, with the robot, once you have it in hand, you can do a couple things like adjust the optical wave. I will point out if you can't hear me very well, I am in a lab. There's lots of noisy things happening. Um, so uh, you you sound good. You it. you sound good. good. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, let me just demonstrate uh, how obstacle avoidance works here. So robot is in in the lab view. So let me turns. I'm actually going to turn it the other way. We're going to go all the way around. And I'm going to try and demo for you how the robot... There we are. So what I'm doing right now is driving the robot directly into the ramp. And you can see that it's kind of slipping. Or if you look at lab view two. So I'm trying, I'm pressing the W key to highlight that we're using WASD right now, uh, WASD keys. And this is just showing that we have it set to a specific distance. But you could imagine in certain situations, like on an oil rig or in any place that, where the equipment is pretty dense, that you might need to get through a threshold or even doors. So you can turn the obstacle avoidance off. The other thing I'd like to point out um, is that you can see that Spot is actually walking over things. So I just walked over a rock pile. And I didn't do anything. I didn't have to tell the robot to do anything at this point. All I had to do was be like, okay, go in that direction. And so what that means is that the robot is super easy to drive. I don't consider myself like a gamer or anything. And I'm able to drive this robot in like under 15 seconds. And anybody really can. So you don't have to be an expert. I would say drone driving drones might be a little more complicated at times. Hmm. But um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm actually going to go on the course and I'm going to show uh, the robot going over different types of terrain as well, like steps. That's probably one of its uh, superpowers here. It, that, is, that is definitely a superpower of wa walking up steps. I've watched, again, just in public safety, I've watched a number of times people trying to get up the stairwells and they, you know, chose to use drones while flying over the top of stuck robots. So it's fantastic to see this obstacle here. So what you're seeing in the front view is I'm actually driving with a different feature called Touch to Go. The robot's actually right in front of me right now, um, and that's why you can hear it. <laughs> so. Um, and so what this allows me as the driver to do is to give it a general direction, but then I'm also using my A and B keys to turn it. So you do have a lot of control over this robot. It's very easy to drive, and the obstacle avoidance helps, so I don't need to worry about it ro like running into anything, mm -hmm. um, which is something people worry about because Spot looks like an animal, and they're like, oh, I don't want to hurt it. <laughs> but you don't have to worry. We, we test these things all the time. Uh, so what I'm going to do now is try and get Spot to trip over this ball. Um, it's actually very challenging. Uh, it was very easy. I always like to tell the story that it was very easy when I started uh, working here in September to knock the robot over. <laughs> um, and now it's much more difficult. So I'm going to try a couple more times and then I'm going to try our it and it's going to tip over. So this is to demonstrate that the robot is going to fall over. We know this. Um, this is something that we took into account at Boston Dynamics. 
Um, and so we always want to make sure that the robot can uh, get back up. So I'm going to wait for it to reconnect for a minute. Uh, and then we'll do uh, a self-write demonstration, uh, which will be exciting to see. So I'd recommend looking at LabVIEW 2 um, once it reconnects. And one second. Do you have a few questions lined yeah. up? Be right after this. Great. So now it's starting the self-write sequence. And so now it's actually in a very interesting position where the front legs are below the hind leg. And all I have to do is press W and the robot is up and ready to go again and to continue the mission. So you can imagine like when you're using this robot, if you have a payload on it um, and it falls over, it's actually gonna use a different pattern sequence uh, to self to get itself back up because if it has a payload on it with a roll cage, for example, it tends to fall on its side. So it uses a different um, sequence to get back up. So that's something mm. uh, that we take into account as well. That it's never gonna fall the same way twice. Um, and yeah. So. <laughs> Excellent. So I, I definitely see this. If you want to just go ahead and put Hannah back on the screen there, Jace. Uh, I'm going to just ask her a couple of things. Um, I, you know, you brought up the very last point there. A roll cage over the top of the drone, or over the top of spot. You know, you've got to, a way to protect, uh, you know, as far as that goes. I could imagine the, the amount of basically abuse you actually do see out there that you do you try to do and create that and and i and i definitely see that on your guys' own uh payloads that how the how the protection of that has actually turned out you know as far as you creating that uh and you and you made that point of like it never falls the same way and basically you just explained you can make it stand up in a way so it doesn't want to hurt that payload as much right is that basically what I understand? Yeah. yeah, so when it has, for example, our PTP and our spot cam, which are pretty, they're actually fairly tall payloads um, when they're stacked up on top of each other, the robot tends to fall on its side. So the robot will tuck its, uh, the side that it fell on, it will tuck its legs underneath and sort of pop itself back uh, to a stable position. Mm. Uh, so that's, that's helpful. What you saw was more of a sequence where if it falls directly on its back, uh, which is a little, it's a more rare case mm -hmm. uh, of it completely flipping over. Yeah. Oh, my heck. I mean, this, I, I, like I said, I think you pretty much do have one of the coolest jobs is be able to, to mess around with this stuff and a cool space to do it. I think that's really neat. Um, I'm, I'm really, I can't say it enough, really excited to try to get my hands on this thing and just do a number of fun yeah. things, you know. Uh, and uh, I know, I think that you had, uh, the only reason I had mentioned this, uh, uh, operation from uh, another space, another place, another part of the world that you can actually try to control something is that you you had did uh, send a link out for that, and I and I was just like, wow, you know, just being able to do uh, that kind of you know control in a different place in a different drone world. Everybody wants to be able to. Uh, remotely control this or view it from a different area or a different place and it's just totally feasible with a not drone setup you know and and it really a, a hand to your guys' team on on actually making this uh, viable and, and available in the commercial space uh, so I'm uh, yeah great job Hannah thank you for <laughs> the demonstration I'm sure we're gonna of have course. some questions We'll have some questions for you, so that's that's kind of where we're at. Matt, did you have uh, anything else we to add as far as uh, control and capability and uh, uh, testing, uh, as far as anything like that, just in case? Uh, um, anything that you wanted to add? Sure. So I think the one the one thing I can show uh, and I can add is what does it look like. Uh, when the robot's doing an autonomous mission. Uh, and then we'll open up to Q&A. So here is a good example of what our auto walk mission would look like. So on the bottom right, this is sort of how the robot sees the world, like Anna was showing. And then on the left-hand side, 
you can see the different waypoints and the robots trying to get from one using visual odometry uh, to identify where it is in the world. Um, but I think everything that we showed earlier was us directly controlling the robot. In this case, the robot has been driven along a path and then been asked to go repeat that path. Um, so this is just one more sort of interesting way to look at how the robot can operate. Uh, and I think it could be, you know, obviously pretty valuable for a lot of customers. So mm. that'll be the one last piece that uh, I think is worth adding in and would love to open it up uh, and hear if there are any questions that we can answer mm -hmm. uh, and go from there. Okay, well, let's, uh, we definitely do have some questions and Jace is gonna help us moderate that the best we can. Again, uh, uh, directing it to it, whoever it might be more pertinent to, but if, uh, if we feel like it's a question that's like a little bit more over our head or something like that, we can definitely get back to people if there's any of those questions. But Jace, let's go ahead and see what we've got as far as questions. All right, so. We've got, John's going to be hearing me on a little bit of a delay, but that's okay. Uh, <laughs> could Spot be used for video-based 3D modeling? That would be either, either Matt or Hannah to give us some type of idea for that. Sure, I can take that. Um, but, yeah, certainly. So, uh, you know, we have, I think, you know, John showed earlier the an emissent uh, 3D modeling solution or SLAM solution that's being used that could absolutely be mounted on top of the robot, integrated on the robot, uh, and used um, 100%. Yeah, so one thing to think about is the way that we view the robot, in a sense, is the transportation of a sensor of interest for you. Mm -hmm. So if you have a particular sensor or data collector or, you know, thing that you use for a video or image capture, you can mount that on the robot. It's been designed to do that. Uh, so think of the robot in that case as purely the transportation for your sensor. Excellent. Jace, you got another one? Yes, I do. Hold on. All right. Uh, we've also got, uh, let me see here, sorry, um, any, what, what does it look like as far as winter and or snow testing? Again, yeah, I that's, that's, a, that's sure. a great yeah. question. Uh, oh, I, I, I didn't want to interrupt, but I, as well as it was kind of a, people are going to ask, I want to put it in some pretty crappy environments. <laughs> I know you guys have an IP rating, but yeah. Hannah, if you wanted to maybe express maybe some of your testing you've done in some of these environments. Uh, yeah, so I mean, we test in all sorts of different environments. We're located in uh, Waltham, so we're very familiar with snow and ice. Uh, and we also have a huge uh, outdoor park that's near us that we also test the robot uh, where it goes up and down different types of terrain. Uh, we do it in snow, we do it uh, in icy conditions. Right now we have a really neat feature uh, where you can adjust the ground friction for the robot. So it essentially looks like it's taking tiny baby steps like you would if you're going across the slippery surface. <laughs> and so we've developed that to improve its behavior um, because I think one of the most iconic things uh, on the internet is like big dogs flipping on ice. And like that always impressed me. And so um, Spot behaves pretty much the same way, except now you have more control over it. So you can tell it, uh, you can determine like what exactly the surface is going to be like, and then give that information to the tablet, and then continue on your mission and um, help Spot uh, basically navigate that terrain even better. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> Next one, Jace, We're, let's just keep popping these out, yeah. All right, so next one we're going to look at, um, kind of in the same vein, but a little bit different. What is the heat resistance or tolerance for areas near open flames or heated vessels like boilers? So overall, I, I guess maybe even go a step farther, what's your heat heat rating and the coldest rating? You know, your kind of operate, operational um, range, I guess you would call it. 
Sure. Yeah, so I, I can take that one as well. So um, it'll go up to 45 Celsius. So if it goes above that temperature, you know, it, in a self-preservation mode, it will shut the electronics down and the robot will sit. Uh, so pretty hot, you know, but there are certainly hotter environments out there. Uh, and then it'll go down to negative 20 C. Um, so again, pretty cold. Uh, we do think at some point there will be future morphologies of the robot that have a higher temperature range or a lower temperature range. Um, but, you know, for today, that's where the robot is, is specced out to operate. Excellent. Next one, Jace. There we go. Click one, two, three. <laughs> um, Real world battery life. What what are we looking at as far as uh, endurance for this this platform? Sure, good question. Uh, yeah. So, oh, fire away, Hannah. Sorry. <laughs> it's gonna be like after you, and then we'll never answer the question. Um, but <laughs> I'll take it. Uh, so, uh, ninety minutes is the uh, the basic operating time, and it does decrease a bit uh, with uh, some payloads, depending on how heavy they are. Uh, the robot can carry up to 14 kilograms, so it, um, it doesn't vary it too much, but there, it, it does make it decrease slightly uh, hmm. when there's a heavier payload on it. I, I'm going to go one step further with that, Hannah, and it comes down to operational. One of the questions we get often is the charging, not just time, but does it have batteries that are able to be removed then go ahead and redeploy very quickly. Is it have a self-charging station? You know, do we have to worry too much about batteries exploding by, you know, as far as maintenance goes or, or anything like that cycles in time? So I know I just did a bunch of questions, but main one, does yeah. it have a battery you replace? Uh, is it difficult to maintain the charge and how long does that take, you know? Yeah, so that's a, it's a really important question because we use lithium ion batteries. So we're aware of those um, the dangers, but they are, they're stable, they're good batteries. Um, and basically the robot comes with two batteries, they're about nine pounds each, uh, which sounds heavy, but they're, they're, not, they're not too bad. Um, if I can put my hands up, like they're about like maybe like this big. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I know, like it's hard to tell. But essentially, uh, they're easy to handle. Uh, you, they have a handle on them, so you can swap the battery out of the robot really quickly. Um, it's probably just about as fast as if you're changing a remote battery, uh, one that you use in your home. Uh, so it's, it's very simple. Um, and in terms of dangers, uh, if you leave the battery in the robot uh, for too long, it does overheat and could damage it. Um, but the same precautions as you would take with any uh, big battery. So we have fireproof cases that we keep them in um, and just follow, um, you know, store it in a reasonable temperature and that sort of thing. Yeah. So I, I don't think uh, an hour is uh, too much, an hour and a half, you know, basically an hour and a half of operational time uh, for this size of a platform is, is nothing beyond what most people would be expecting, you know an hour's walk around a facility and hours up into a space and, and back down is actually a really long time for something to keep people safe, of course. So good question on, a, on the battery question. Jace, do you have uh, what else on the next one? I've got a couple uh, from the same gentleman. Um, he did say, as a tongue-in-cheek, please tell me you're de developing a wireless charging pad that looks like a robot dog bed. Um, I'd love to see that. <laughs> uh, but uh, so real world battery life there you go and then also has there been any uh, quote hardness testing and quote uh, for high radiation environments can you speak to a little bit to any type of shielding or something like that in those um, high radiation environments sure sure thing um, so First, I can show you this is the battery. So that's what it looks like. Uh, it basically just pops in, pops out, so you get a general idea for the size. Um, to answer the question about the charging, so we are working on a charging station that the robot will go back, uh, mount.
the folks that are putting sort of a doghouse up and over it to protect it from the elements. Um, so yeah, you can you can absolutely do that. Then the next question on radiation. So the robot itself is not rad hardened. Um, that being said, we have a customer that recently sent the robot into a 3,500 millirem per hour environment. Mm. Um, and my understanding is you would not send a person into that environment. And the robot performed well. Um, we do think at some point, uh, you know, the cameras or something will, would eventually fry if it gets enough radiation. But the electronics on the robot are sort of deep enough into the belly, so to speak, of the robot, that they seem to be protected uh, pretty well. So we do have a couple of, uh, you know, booties for the robot's feet for radiation environments or, you know, radiation shielding. And all those things are certainly uh, in, in consideration because that's such a great application and such a great use case. Mm. Uh, so, excellent. Between guy here, Jace. I mean, that's. Uh, why don't you just go ahead and keep firing off questions if we still got it? I mean, we've got. We've. More IP Let, let's do a couple more questions, and hopefully, we can get to the majority of those. So, go ahead. Go ahead. Sure. We've just got a couple more of these. Um, let me see here. Uh, now, something you already answered, can it operate among operators in a manufacturer, manufacturing setting? Um, seems like you kind of answered that to a degree of, um, you know, it's operating around people, it's the obstacle avoidance, that kind of stuff, unless you have something else to add. Sure. So from a safety standpoint, we do recommend you stay a couple meters away from the robot, um, just given the fact that, you know, really fast if it slips um, and you know we don't want people to get hurt uh, so it is in a sense you know designed to be operated you know the idea of having an indirect interaction with people you know we would sort of discourage that from a safety standpoint cool all right thank you uh, we'll keep going. Uh, does this meet DOD specs for encryption, transmission for use on military bases by cops and fire departments? So I don't know 100% um, what, the, what the spec is, but I can tell you they, it has been deployed um, in the public safety realm in, in DOD. So the robot itself, the communications are, you know, 2.4 gigahertz point-to-point Wi-Fi. Um, and then there are no, you know, upload, there's no automatic upload data that's going back into the Boston Dynamics cloud, so to speak. Um, so if you do want to shut the robot for just communicating direct to the controller, direct to the robot, uh, that you can do that. We can follow up to get a firm answer, but um, hopefully that gives it a, a decent idea. Cool. And I think uh, this could be a um, this could be an answer for Hannah. Uh, what are the dimensions of the spot when it's in a stored configuration, and how much does it weigh? Yeah. So it weighs uh, about uh, sixty-five kilograms, and in terms of total height, it's about two feet high. Um, and then the length of it, uh, I forget, that's like, <laughs> uh, Matt will probably know exactly the dimensions, even though I do look at it all day. Um, but it, what it does do is when you're storing it, it sits down. So it's, um, it will sit directly on the ground and it's only like five inches, it's uh, five inches off the ground. So. All right, then I think uh, probably one of the last ones that we've got here, uh, ratings for intrinsic safety. That's always that's always a big one that so, we get asked. Yeah, that's a, a fair. Intrinsically safe robots is a very difficult robotics challenge. Um, so, but that being said, you know, our oil and gas customers are interested in deploying in class one, div one, or you know, zone one type environments. Um, so spot by itself is not interesting. 
using the robot today is opening up a hot work permit, um, mounting a gas sensor on the robot, and if it detects an elevated level of gas, uh, it will emergency stop the motors on the robot. Uh, we do think at some point in the future, uh, there may be an in intrinsically safe version of the robot, um, but you know we're talking about potentially a couple of years uh, until that happens. You know, we often say for any one application, Spot has been both over-engineered and under-engineered, uh, depending on what you're looking for. Uh, so the idea of building particular morphologies of the robot that are focused on particular applications is something that we are, you know, considering, uh, but there are no official plans to, to do that at this point. Last question I have, and it's oh, okay. Hold on, we get the audio. Probably the only thing I have for you, Matt, is that now we're we're pretty much moving RMUS relationship into a commercial uh, purchasing. You know, I mean, we're 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 able to basically buy the buy spot, uh, and in the resale portion of things, we're we're creating this. Um, I would say that. That when you watch some of these, these, you know, the things that Hannah has done so far, uh, the testing, the automation, the integration. I mean, you're the, you're, you're looking at like something that's like half a million dollars, right? I mean, three hundred thousand dollars, right? I mean, I mean, realistically, we have drones in the world that are half a million dollars, and people are like, boy, that's that's not that bad. But what are we looking at realistically on something like this? I mean, realistically, you can get you can ballpark it for me if you want to. But even just like, I think it might really kind of. That's usually a question that comes right up. How much is that? Sure. Yeah. So maybe we underpriced it. If you think we should be selling for <laughs> half a million dollars, uh, but the robot, the base level robot, is about seventy-five thousand dollars. So seventy-four thousand five hundred dollars is the list price on the robot itself. Uh, and then you can get different payloads on top of that. Um, so the base robot comes with two batteries, case, uh, charger, all the basic things that you saw uh, Hannah use today. Uh, the different payloads range from a couple thousand dollars to, you know, $30,000, depending on what you're looking for. Um, but yeah, we wanted to sort of reduce the barrier of entry to mm -hmm. get the robot out into the world and to see what's possible with it. So we wanted to make the price attainable. Um, and hopefully we did so with, uh, with that price point. Well, again, I'm just... I'm just going to make one more knock on public safety here because I have seen quarter million dollar robots that have not been able to get from X to, to Y to Z. They've gotten, they've got totally messed up, you know, and like I said, it, it, they can't get through dirty laundry that's been left all over the house or something like that. I mean, I've just seen these areas that the drone seems to seem to fit the solution to try and, and fly that into these spaces, uh, whereas I definitely see spot. I mean, kind of just overtaking that area, uh, especially with a price point such as that. It just seems approachable, like you said. It seems very, very much approachable for people to get it out there and try it out and, and do their thing. So um, I think, Jace, I, if I'm not uh, correct, I mean, I think we're all done with questions. And if there's anything last minute, and if good. Okay, excellent. Well, um, you know, I, I really wanted to say thank you for the Boston Dynamics team here. It's underway, this relationship underway. Uh, messing around and focusing on uh, other use cases. Other use cases. Uh, definitely making this available to not just us or them. Okay, we did, we did lose Otto. We did lose Otto. Well, uh, give me a thumbs up. Uh, give me a thumbs up if you guys can. <laughs> the audio is a little haywire, but uh, thank you very much for, for hosting us today. It was great. Hopefully it was informative. Um, so, yeah, this, this was a lot of fun. So we certainly appreciate the invitation. Yeah, and we'll, we'll just for the um, everybody that's doing the, you know, how we actually integrate, mess with, 
show it as soon as we get a unit you know we'll be getting back with matt and hannah making sure i'm operating it correctly uh doing what i'm supposed to be doing correctly and uh, from there on out we'll do another webinar shortly uh, i think on just what we're our experience is because i think that brings a lot of value to everybody is to not just be like oh that's a neat thing i saw on youtube actually having you know real world touching and 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 messing and and you know operation i mean I, it's really a cool thing and i am not, i'm gonna say it one more time hannah has got one of the coolest jobs i've ever seen as far as stuff i mean i Thank i'm gonna you. hand it to you it's it's, it's really cool and an amazing amount of engineering here that's way beyond a lot of the stuff we've ever seen so uh i think that'll wrap it up thank you again matt and hannah for being here uh, really appreciate that, and as well, um, I think Jace, if that's uh, it. Uh, I, I did. I'm sorry, I skipped over one thing. Someone uh -huh. had asked about uh, what we need to do for qualifying for leasing options, that kind of stuff. Oh, a little bit more leasing that, stuff. Leasing that kind of thing. I think that's something that. Uh, well, contact just contact us. We'll make sure we get uh, contact RMUS. Of course. So, of, of, of course, when it comes down to purchasing, leasing, um, any proof of concept, uh, showing the equipment, anything like that, of course, we're, we're able to uh, run that through the sales team. So, of course, that's sales at rmus.com. Uh, anyone that, uh, again, wants to have a little bit more hands on time or technical questions, you definitely get a hold of the tech team, you know, at the end of this. So, uh, that. You know, we're, we're always available for that kind of stuff. And again, I wanted to just thank Boston Dynamics for arranging us hosting and as well showing capability of uh, the spot. So thank you guys for joining us. And if you have anything further, let us know. Thank you very much. This was great. Thanks, thank guys. You very much.